So cellular respiration is what all this is about. And I need you to know some big points as we go through this. First of all, we went through all the macromolecules and we know that we want to use a glucose, glucose to make ATP. And that starts with combusting, yeah. hydrolyzing glucose from C6H12, six to C3H4, O3. And we'll see how that happens. And we'll go through step at a time. And I'll tell you what's important to know. I'll give you the answers for the exam. How's, is that fair? But yeah. you got to learn the same way. So yeah. every so cell what has the ability doing. to take in glucose. Right. And there's a finite number of those carriers. Glucose comes in through facilitated diffusion because it's not, it's not very lipid soluble. So it has a protein carrier that takes it in through diffusion though, it's still high to low concentration. So getting the glucose in the cells, number one, and you need insulin for that. Insulin will bring, help bring glucose into the cell. And, and you'll see later, it also brings glucose into the liver to store it. So a catabolizing, hydrolyzing glucose split into two molecules, three carbon molecules and a two pyruvic acid dose two. Okay, and this is what it looks like. It kind of makes sense. A couple of the hydrogens are gonna be sent to reduce these or be reduced by NAD. And later on, you'll see something called FAD, which I talked about last time. The oxidation reduction reactions our friend hydrogen, remember hydrogen, one electron, easy to give it, easy to get it. Okay, so the first step in glycolysis is forming the two pyruvate. So the ADP has to be phosphorylated to form ATP. So in general, you get four ATPs that are made from glycolysis. Now, it costs you some, too, though, what you're going to see in the steps. So it costs you two. It makes four, but it costs you two ATPs just to, just to make ATP. And the net is two ATPs. Okay? So glycolysis. What do we know about glycolysis? It doesn't happen in the mitochondria. It happens in the cytoplasm, number one. Number two, it doesn't need oxygen. This is anaerobic. I think we went through that pretty good last week. This is anaerobic. It's, it's hard to say respiration, but it is part, I and mean, we can't have aerobic respiration without glycolysis because we're using glucose. So the net is 2 ATP through glycolysis. That's your takeaway. That's the answer for glycolysis. And I left this on because this is kind of cool, just showing you that it costs you a couple of ATPs to get glucose to be broken down, okay? But in the, in the process, it also gives off free energy too, as well. Because going from ATP, ADP to ATP, you add energy. But going from ATP to ADP, that's exergonic. So you're also gonna give off a little free energy to help the, to help the process go along. And we talked about energy last time. So hopefully you got that down. Professor, quick question. Yeah. If you have zero uh, glucose, oh. and you're, you're going into uh, aerobic respiration, does your body go through glucogenolysis? Like a, uh, no, gl a gluconeogenesis is what we're, I'll tell you that later. Yeah, good question. Okay. So the process is going to be gluconeogenesis in the beginning. And I'll show you that later. That's a great question. Really important for endocrine, too. So, anyway. You go along the process of building the pyruvic acid, and there's two of those. And in the process, you're going to net two ATPs. And you give off a little free energy as well. Okay, so glucose plus two NAD. And of course, you need to phosphorylate the ADP and the glucose. Let me just move the mics if you don't mind. I can find you. Let me just mute your mics if you don't mind. Oh, great. Thank you. I think thank you. Hold on. That really sounds like a table saw to me. Right? So two pyruvic acid, and you have these two NADH, 
and through ATP, and that's really what we need. So this is basically what it looks like if oxygen is not brought into the picture. So if there's no oxygen present, right? And you're gonna get some energy out of this. Pyruvic acid is gonna be converted via this lactose uh, lactate dehydrogenase, the enzyme to lactic acid. And we talked about that last time. You know, if there's no energy present, then lactic acid will be the first byproduct. So think about this, like, right? I might've brought this up last time, but think about your heart muscle needs oxygen constantly. I think I made that point. So if you have death of that cell, the myo myocardial infarction where the cells actually die, they can't undergo aerobic respiration. So they'll do anything they can to make the muscles contract and try to get cardiac output. So they'll, they'll go through anaerobic respiration, something like the lactic acid cycle, which can only get you so far. So just to see how, what the cells will do to try to get energy and, and make them work like muscle cells, of course, and the cardiac cells. So of course the lactate acid cycle is anaerobic. And it happens in the cytoplasm too. This is not the mitochondria. We're getting there. We're getting to that seventh grade powerhouse of the cell. So the, look at the, just look at this, right? Look at three carbons. You have these hydrogens. You have the help of the coenzyme here. So technically, and, and this is important too, Chris, like if, if you had to make pyruvic acid, you just reverse this. The liver can reverse this reaction. And reverse it even more and make something that looks like glucose. So I'll, I'll write it really weird, like glucose. It's not exactly the same um, molecular formula, the way it looks, it's a stereoisomer, but it can actually convert kind of like a, a bad copy of glucose and then glucose could be used. So it's, the liver can do something like this. It's important to know that. So when you're converting, again, this is anaerobic, right? Similar to like when you're making, like when grandpa's making his wine out in the backyard, fermentation from grapes, right? The glucose, fructose in the grapes to ferment it to alcohol. So that's anaerobic respiration. How much? Two ATP. So between the two anaerobic um, met metabolisms that we just talked about, you get about four ATP. So that's not good for running a marathon, of course. That's good for walking up the stairs, maybe doing a small sprint, right? So the muscle cells can survive if, unless they're dead already. But think about skeletal muscle now using lactic acid. And the more lactic acid you have to do will be converted and used. And then you get this painful muscle. The acid in your muscle will kind of activate some of your pain receptors. So that burning you feel after running down to Chipotle, okay? Red blood cells, they don't have a mitochondria. Do you believe that? This red blood cell is basically an erythrocyte. All it does is carry oxygen, all right? So it doesn't have a mitochondria. It has a cell membrane, right? So they could use lactic acid fermentation to run their cycles about diffusion. Osmosis, really important for the... Uh, the cell. Anybody know? I like to get in your faces. Let me get in your face. Let me get in your face. Like actually in your face. Does anybody know um, what? How long does a red blood cell live? I mean, it doesn't have a nucleus. So how's it going to divide? Anybody know? That's okay. There's not. There's not jeopardy. There's no money involved. So uh, like, take a guess. Around, oh gosh, I, I remember, but I don't remember like a, a hundred and- Yeah. Three? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, like it's, a, it's like four months. It's like 120 yeah. days, 120 days okay. cell could live. So, you know, if, if it's using glucose through fermentation to, to get some ATP just so it could run its membrane cycles. But what's the test you get? Like if you're checking to see if I'm type two but diabetic, besides fasting glucose, what a, what's another test? Anybody see? see uh, hemoglobin A1C. A1C, hemoglobin A1C. 
So A1C will tell you how long that glucose has been hanging around on your blood based on the lifespan of a red blood cell. Yeah, the A1C, very good. So that's, that, that's a good test for um, insulin resistance, like uh, diabetes type two. A1C is based on the red blood cell glucose. Not the mitochondria, because it doesn't even have a mitochondria. I don't design these things, it's amazing. So that's basically the anaerobic. Aerobic is, is of course gonna make much more ATPs because we're using oxygen. Remember the oxidation reduction reactions we talked about last time where ultimately a electron is gonna be accepted or, or given off or reduced or oxidized. So oxygen is the last of the oxygen acceptors. So oxygen, that's why they call it oxidation. Because this is the, and this is miraculous. I don't know how this happens, but the oxygen is actually split in half and reduced. It's crazy. But without oxygen, that can't happen. So the whole business with, and what do we call these things? Like the, the Krebs cycle or tricarboxyl, uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle. And my favorite is the electron transport chain because that's really where, where it happens. Let's spell it right though, for goodness sake. So in glycolysis, we had what was called direct phosphorylation, where the ADP was directly phosphorylated without oxygen. In electron transport chain, it's called oxidative phosphorylation. Two, two L's. Okay, so this is oxidative because we're using oxygen in the mitochondria and all this happens inside the mitochondria. And here's the equation basically what happens and of course ATP, glucose, and that happens through glycolysis, not in the mitochondria. But now you're adding oxygen to the mitochondria with the breakdown products of now pyruvate. So every, you can't have aerobic respiration without glycolysis. This is where it starts. And you want it to start with glucose. And I'll show you different pathways, how you can use other macromolecules like lipids, of course, and hopefully not, but you could use proteins as well to enter into the mitochondria in the form of pyruvic acid. Okay, so we have 2-NADH, which was a, a product of the glycolysis and of course the two ATPs. Did I forget to... Um, record? Somebody's asking questions. Somebody have a question? I see the chat going here. Someone have a question? I can't see the chat. Can't get to it. Okay. So pyruvic acid is going to be used in the citric acid cycle, which is also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA, or Krebs cycle for old folks like me. And the NADH, again, this is reduced. NAD will be oxidized to phosphorylate the ATP to make ATP. And you know the enzymes, ATP synthase. The fate of pyruvic acid, the fate. Okay, so it enters the mitochondria. So this is an important fact. Now we're starting oxidative phosphorylation. So pyruvic acid enters the matrix the inside. There's actually double membrane in the mitochondria. And you do get a, a bit of two carbon dioxide uh, molecules as well. So you don't have to remember acetic acid in all the steps. So right now, it's important to you know, for you to know that this was the one of the products of glycolysis, and that's going to enter into the mitochondria. And you're forming acetic acid. And then you form, or it's combined with, coenzyme A to form acetyl-CoA. So one glucose molecule now forms two molecules of acetyl-CoA, which is biochemical changes in pyruvic acid. And you get those couple of CO2. So you're already starting to get CO2 because that's a problem, CO2, excess CO2. So pyruvic acid combined with coenzyme A will give you acetyl-coenzyme A. 
And here we have another reduction of NADH. So acetyl coenzyme A will combine with another acid. You don't have to know that. Stick with just acetyl coenzyme A to form citric acid. And this is why it's called the citric acid cycle. Yeah, okay. So this is what starts the citric acid cycle. And again, you don't have to know all the acids like the oxaloacetic acid. But are you with me so far? Going through, let me get in your face again, just to make sure. Oh, I just saw the chat. Well, okay, that has nothing to do with the citric acid cycle, so I can't talk about that. So pyruvic acid eventually will be converted through a couple of steps into citric acid. And we're in the mitochondria. Are we cool with that? All right. So that's good. That's good. I had another point to bring up, but I forgot it now. It was a good yeah, so point. I have a question. Yeah, sure. The acetylcholine is the one that's, that's uh, broken down into at the end of the, the, Kreb, the citric acid cycle and then it's reused in the new cycle. Good point. Yeah. And, and it's going to be formed into oxaloacetic acid again. So like the leftovers get used in the next cycle? Is yeah, that's that right. Happens? That's right. And the enzymes. And the enzymes. Remember, the enzymes don't get destroyed. They're reused. Right. The important question. events. I kept this here. So GTP, right, guanosine, triphosphate. So this is this is another a source of the phosphate, and it donates the phosphate to the ADP to form more ATP. So you're still forming ATP, but slowly in the Krebs cycle. You're not really forming tons of ATP. I mean, when I first started learning this stuff, we, uh, the electron transport chain isn't as important as it is today. So the Krebs cycle was the the main source using these oxidation reduction reactions, but it really happens in the electron transport chain. Yeah, so this is reduced NADH, okay? And it happens twice, of course. So this is a nice little drawing I drew here, talking about what happens in the cytoplasm. I like this, that you know this, the cytoplasm, the anaerobic, respiration takes place like glyco uh, glycolysis and lactic acid fermentation. And then pyruvic acid will enter. And with the reaction of reducing NAD, you will get carbon dioxide. And remember there's two, there's two pyruvic acids, right? There's two of them. So two carbon dioxide molecules. Then you'll form this acetyl-CoA, which will be converted to citric acid. So this is kind of simple, right? And you'll have these oxidation reduction reactions and phosphorylations with the help of something like GTP and giving off carbon dioxide. And you don't have to know the ketoglutaric acid or the, or the oxaloacetic acid. Products of the citric acid cycle. Now, this is what you have to know. This is what you have to know. 6-NADH, which is really important because now we got these electrons. We could go from oxidation reduction over and over to give off that free energy. And then two FAD, flavin, nicotine and flavin. So two ATPs only, that's not a lot. So right now we've only built maybe six ATPs. We've got a bunch of carbon dioxide involved in this. So this is important that you know the, the, the products of each step, okay? So now the electron transport chain and this happens within the folds of crystals. I believe I have a really good picture coming up later with the electron pump. <clears throat> and they serve as transporters of basically electrons. Remember the electron, that's the guy who wants a party or girl who wants a party, all right? And you hear these, these flavin mononucleotide, coenzyme Q is a good one to remember because it, it acts as a, um, an acceptor for the, pro, for the electron. Cytochromes, usually involve iron. Again, and you're actually reducing the iron. So these coenzymes and the cytochromes, like cytochrome makes you think of color, right? Color, and, and iron does have a bit of a color when it's bound with oxygen, as you know, in the red blood cell. So the hydrogens are not transported with the electrons. So basically the hydrogen becomes plus, right? If the electron, if a hydrogen loses an electron, it doesn't look like this anymore. It looks like this because it only has one electron. I think that's how we started the last lecture. So hydrogen is, is doing all the, 
the giving of the electron. And these are reused. FAD and NAD are constantly reused, like Chris said. So they can become reduced by taking on that electron and giving it off as well during these reactions, going from one energy level to the other. So it's a chain. That's why it's a chain. And every time an electron is transferred, you get free energy. I'm not even talking about ATP anymore. I'm talking about energy from an electron going from one energy level to another, from one molecule to another. And that's really what's used to phosphorylate. So ADP is ADP, and we've seen this before, plus a phosphate will give you ATP. And the enzyme, most of the time, is ATP synthase, not ACE. Okay, and now this is the oxidative phosphorylation. And again, the law of conservation of energy, not all the energy is 100%. You keep using it for something else over and over and over. So here you go. This is kind of like the electron transport chain without the nice pictures. I'm going to show you in a minute. So the electrons are being transferred and then these become reduced and oxi um, oxidized. Again, you can use coenzyme Q or the cytochromes, which are really iron containing molecules that are giving and taking electrons. And this will keep happening. And ultimately oxygen is the ultimate end of this process. So you need oxygen or else this would stop dead. It wouldn't continue. It would never continue to make the ATP. It would stop in, without the presence of oxygen. And that's the takeaway with aerobic respiration. It happens in the presence of oxygen. And then oxygen split in half. I have no idea how that happens. But of course, water is extremely important. So ultimately, oxygen is the, the ultimate acceptor. Okay. So this chemiosmotic or chemiosmotic theory is about the pumps that are pumping the hydrogens with their electrons from the inner mitochondria to the in-between mitochondria, not out of the mitochondria, it's still in the mitochondria. And they move through the inner membrane with these pumps. And this is a theory, but it's a really, another really good theory. Like when we talk about muscle contraction later on, there's some theories that make a lot of sense. So every time this hydrogen moves across the membrane with the pump, it provides free energy. And ATP synthase, which is remember dehydration synthesis, will form your ATPs. And this happens over and over again. Here's the picture I promised. I promise you this. So th this is the outer member membrane of the mitochondria. This is the inner membrane, the cristae. And this is where your hydrogen pumps are. So every time you have this oxidation, hydrogen gives off free energy and it goes down and down and down and down again and again. And ultimately you have, of course you have in the membrane, you have the ATP synthase, which is a inner membrane enzyme. Remember enzymes are all proteins. Well, for the most part, they're all proteins. So this gives the extra energy or it gives them, I'm sorry, extra catalyst to form the ATP through the electron transport chain. And of course, that's oxidative phosphorylation. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So without oxygen, this is not gonna happen. It won't happen, okay? So water, of course, is formed as another byproduct. Let me just see, it, didn't, it doesn't mention this, which is really important. Of course, ultimately, you're gonna get a lot of ATP between, from glycolysis to this step. But totally from, from that one molecule of glucose, I might've mentioned this last time, in, in a really good cell, a really good functional cell, you're gonna get, um, I mean, I'm gonna, I guess I, I could say 38 ATP, that's a lot, but that's ex that's extremely efficient cell doing this. And the state of the cell, of course, is very important. Let's say a perfect cell, 38 ATP, you're gonna get six H2O, six waters and six CO2s per one molecule of glucose. So this, this combines everything. This combines glycolysis, 
This combines lactic acid or direct phosphorylation. It involves the Krebs cycle, it involves the electron trans transport right to the end. So that is the ultimate, and that's what you should know. So I'll go back to that. So about 38 ATP, that's very, very good. Six waters and six carbon dioxides. Of course, in the presence of oxygen, ultimately, all right? Balance sheet. Yeah, so this is like, you know, if you go on a trip, you buy all the pack, you buy in a package here. So you could have direct phosphorylation and that's anaerobic. Remember this, direct phosphorylation is anaerobic, glycolysis. And then the citric acid cycle will add a couple more ATPs. Citric acid cycle is the, the Krebs cycle within the mitochondria, that's aerobic, aerobic. Glycolysis, anaerobic. All right, and these don't change. And it's, I guess that holds true for the theory. Oxidative phosphorylation happens in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. Of course, there has to be oxygen there, the rest it won't happen. It would never finish. Varying amounts of ATP. So let's say, let's, let's go for the best. Let's go for the biggest, right? What do you say, Claire? I'd say skeletal muscle could probably do this the best. Although I wish the nerve tissue could do it. Good. 38, you agree? Yes, I agree theoretically. Yeah. Theoretically, but it really doesn't happen all the time. I, I'm almost, I'm almost like weary to say it, but it just sounds so much cooler. It sounds much more, yeah. Yeah, it's probably like 30 on the average, but we could live there, it's okay. You get a lot more. So for each NADH, three ATP, and for FADH, two ATP. And off we go more so yeah so again what it will actually yield when you all is said and done is a little bit less so just basically know how much more atp is made in the electron tra electron transport chain than in anaerobic and krebs cycle that's the takeaway so how are we doing okay we got through that. That's a really hard biochemistry. I mean, I would love to go into it, but I hope you, you know, at least you, you get the whole idea of it because you need ATP. And I, I think you know why, because muscles aren't going to contract. Nerves aren't going to conduct. So evolution wise, you know, we, that's really what we need. We need to, to get our muscles to contract so we can run away from the dinosaur, right? Not so much to, to run and get my coffee, but you know, and your, and your brain as it, as it developed, you need ATP to run your synapses, which you're gonna learn soon. And your brain controls everything. So your, your body will do anything it can, like use fat cells, triglycerides to make ATP if it had to, if there was no available glucose. So our bodies are very sensitive to glucose levels. I think we talk about glucose more than anything else in this class and how it, um, it's the metabolism of it's important. The storage of it is important. The use of it is important. But homeostatically, homeostatically, right? Not high glucose. As much as I'd love to live at Dairy Queen, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be, it's not just a smart thing to do. So you want to keep your glucose levels, you know, within homeostatic range and don't mess with them. Keep them, you know, where they are. Because some people are more prone to diabetes than others. Some people have different metabolisms for carbohydrates than others based on that evolution, genetics, right? That we learn. And you might not have the same enzymes. We learned about enzymes. So you, some of your enzymes might not be the same as somebody else's. And some of it's genetic. I mean, you told me you're all gonna get A's because you said that everything we are is not just genetic or it's not just environmental, it's a mix of both. So how it expresses itself is important. Or listen to uh, my, mine and uh, Katrin's friend Sinclair and just take metformin all the time and pee out all your glucose and keep it homeostatic that way. So that's how important it is though, that studies are really based on that, it really is true. Okay, we got a new subject coming up. This, this is different now. So the reason I brought all that up is because we have to make ATP in one way or another, whether glucose is not available. And sometimes we can use lactic acid because lactic acid can be converted back by the liver to pyruvic acid. And glycogen is our storage of glucose in the liver and skeletal muscles. 
So that's really important. What we do with not only our blood glucose, but what we do with our stored glucose. So here's the words you got to get down. This is where I live. Because when we do endocrine, you have to kind of remember this. Endocrine, the hormones that create these situations like glycogenesis. Now, this is not glucose. We're building glycogen. This means to make genesis, to make make glycogen, which is long chains of glucose. So, and again, there's, there's a, a finite number of storage for glucose because it won't be able to be pulled into the cell because of the solute would be too high. So there's only so much. So it, it's not like, I mean, you could carbo load right before you go out and, and run a marathon, but there's only a finite number of glucose molecules that can even get into your liver to be stored as glycogen. Yeah, so glycogen is a larger molecule, very large, hard to break down actually. Um, polysaccharide, you could call this, this is our po polysaccharide glycogen that's stored glucose, mostly in the skeletal muscles and the liver, and of course, cardiac muscles. Smooth muscles as well, but it's not stored, it's not really stored that way. Professor, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. If your skeletal muscles undergo hypertrophy, can they hold more glycogen in that if case? The, if the cells are bigger, yeah. If the cells are bigger, that's a good question. Probably there is a, a little bit more that can be stored in larger muscles, genetically or through um, exercise, right? Yeah, there probably will be more because there'll be more demand of glucose there. Yeah. So th that would, and there, there's definitely going to be more mitochondria in hypertrophized muscles as well, especially quadriceps. Okay. So glycogenesis, glucose has to be phosphorylated and it's slightly changed and it removes the phosphate and then you have the bond. So you don't have to worry about the bonding so much, but it's long chains connected, glucose connected to each other. Now this is, this is the opposite. So this is, I, I can call it hydrolyzing, right? Hydrolyzing glycogen into glucose. And that's really important. So this is lysing. I guess that's the only way I could say it. Lysing, splitting it. Glycogen. So when a cell needs glucose or the blood needs glucose or a hormone tells it it needs glucose, then glycogen will be broken down and it'll be put into the blood and then into the cells. You don't have to know all the, the phases of glycogenolysis, what happens like glucose one phosphate, which is part of the breakdown of, of glycogen. But glycogen phosphorylase is the catalyst for glycogenolysis. So let's get in the face here and think about this because this is where it really matters. I think I went over this a little bit last time too. So you have glycogenesis, building glycogen, storing glycogen, then you have glycogenolysis, which is breaking it down. So here's the scenario, right? My blood glucose is low, low. My blood glucose is low. You think a hormone is gonna be released to produce glycogenesis or glycogenolysis under normal circumstances? Glycogenolysis. Yeah, because you wanna get, you wanna increase the blood glucose, very good. Now there's a hormone, <laughs> I might've mentioned it before. <clears throat> it's called glucagon. Glucagon is like the evil cousin of insulin. So insulin is gonna enhance glycogenesis, whereas glucagon is going to enhance glycogenolysis. So insulin will decrease your blood glucose, whereas glucagon is gonna increase your blood glucose, all right? So which one's catabolic, insulin or glucagon? glucagon? Yeah, glucagon will be more catabolic towards, towards glycogen, that precious molecule of glycogen. There are, oh, we got a good picture coming up. Got a nice picture. This is the liver. 
Hello, liver. All right, upper right quadrant, a little bit in towards the midline. It's two lobes, falciform ligament in the middle. The liver is a, is a huge manufacturing place in your body. Very important. Take care of your livers. Stay off the Tito's, right? Tito's, we mentioned last time. All right, so a little confusing, this picture. But again, what's happening to the glycogen? Is it increasing blood glucose or decreasing? So insulin is more likely going to bring the glucose back to the liver and into the cells as well. And glucagon is going to increase your blood glucose. And of course, the liver does a lot of this. And in the skeletal muscle as well, and in the cardiac muscle, but mostly in the liver. Manufacturing, a very big manufacturer. So glycogenolysis and forms this glucose 1-phosphate, which you really don't have to know. So it, that does not leave the cell until it's phosphor, the phosphate is, is removed. So this glucose 6-phosphate removes the phosphate. So glucose can enter the bloodstream. So this is a another biochemical reaction that has to happen. So the hormones really enhance this reaction, like glycogenolysis, which would be glucagon in this case. And glucagon. I want to go somewhere else, but I don't want to go there yet because we got to go into one more topic that I want to get to before I bring up another um, situation. And look at this. The liver can convert pyruvic acid to glucose 6-phosphate, of course. So it can return pyruvic acid and it can convert it to glucose ultimately. All right. And this function or this situation is called gluconeogenesis. So it's making new glucose from something else, all right? Other, you know, other than glucose, right? Of course, You're using pyruvic acid in this case. So now let's think about this. I can get your face on this one. So we got three things now. We have glycogenesis, we have glycogenolysis, and now we have gluconeogenesis. What the heck is that? So neo means new, right? Genesis means in the beginning, correct? So gluconeogenesis is going to happen by using some other molecule. Like, like say, I know you guys love this, this whole diabetic um, keto diet thing, but if you don't have glucose in your blood, or you, I'm sorry, I should say a different way. You don't have glucose in your cells. It's not getting into your cells whether it's from um, diabetes or it's from starvation, or if you're silly enough to go on a keto diet for more than three months. So you're not getting the glucose into your cells. So you, your cells basically think that there's not enough glucose, even though there's high glucose in the blood possibly, if that's possible. And it can be if, if, you're, if you're diabetic and you're eating uh, carbohydrates, you're gonna have high blood glucose. But if there is no glucose available, then we have to kind of convert things to glucose like a, a fatty acid or uh, unfortunately, an amino acid, especially if you run out of pyruvic acid and lactic acid. So here's a, here's a, good, here's a good breakdown to understand this. Like, like under normal circumstances, you want to break down glucose, pyruvic acid, glycolysis, boom aerobic respiration, perfect, efficient, maybe even 38 ETPs in your skeletal muscle. But if you, if you don't have that glucose available, at, at first, you're gonna have to start using what's left over from the last cycle, like lactic acid or pyruvic acid, which can be converted by the liver to pyruvic acid, of course, or, or ultimately to something that looks like glucose. So basically the liver is making masquerading macromolecules as glucose. So it's turning them into glucose, but it's not perfect, right? It's not, it's not a perfect molecule of glucose. So you're gonna have byproducts, so it, like the next couple of slides will probably tell you one of the byproducts of using fatty acids 
for aerobic respiration through gluconeogenesis is ketones, right? Ketone bodies. And ketones are, you know, they, they're useful in certain places, but for the most part, it's going to cause ketosis, which could lead to ketoacidosis, which is extremely hostile environment in your blood. Hostile, hostile. Like when, when they run out of uh, Tito's at the liquor store, I get, I get hostile. Never had Tito's either, I swear. Never had it. So gluconeogenesis is going to be basically trying to make a masquerading Greek glucose. It's trying to build glucose. So let me ask you this, Smarty Pants. Which hormone creates gluconeogenesis? Insulin or glucagon? Insulin? No, the opposite. Oh, really? Yeah, think of it this way. Think of it this way, because glucagon wants to increase your blood glucose by gl glycogenolysis, and it kind of goes together. So just making more glucose. We're just making more glucose, all right? So we're going to talk about, uh, probably not today, but maybe maybe like next year, because we don't have class, because next week is doomsday, and then we have an exam. So I don't know when the next time we'll be able to do that. So... We talk about the sympathetic nervous system, right? And the parasympathetic nervous system. Have I mentioned that before? Like when I'm eating my burrito in Central Park and the coyote comes and I go into sympathetic stimulation. Well, what's the stress hormone? Where, where, where was that? One, the, the one catabolic hormone that we always talk about. Cortisol. Yeah, cortisol, right? Cortisol is a glucocorticoid released from the adrenal cortex. And it's completely appropriate when you're in stress mode or... Um, when there's inflammation, because it's an anti-inflammatory. But the problem is glucocorticoids increase your blood glucose by increasing gluconeogenesis directly and glycogenolysis. So your blood sugar is going to go up when you're in times of, of stress due to that release of that glucocorticoid. Kind of makes sense? Which is not healthy for the most part. It's appropriate at first. It's appropriate at first. So anything that's going to increase your blood glucose hormonally is basically going to be causing gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. And there's other macromolecules we have to talk about as well. Like we have to break down fat sometimes through lipolysis to, to get those macromolecules to be used as fuel for ATP when there's no glucose available. And if there's no fat cells or no triglycerides available, if fatty acids, then you have to go into amino acids. You're starting to get that whole trip, How what we want to use first, what we want to use if glucose is not available and hopefully not have to go into your proteins or deanimate your amino acids. So a lot of things that increase your blood glucose so the Cori cycle is basically this whole process of glyco, uh, gluconeogenesis. Again, breaking down your stored glycogen. And insulin will get the glucose back into the muscle cells or back into the liver cells. So we could use lactic acid to form pyruvic acid. And the glucose 6-phosphate, masquerading as regular glucose, will be stored as glycogen if we can do that. And that, that's really a good thing, right? That's really a good thing. And this is basically your glycolysis, right? This is glycolysis or anaerobic here. So that's good use. So here you go. Here's nice little terms. And I like this one. I like this one because you can kind of understand what's going on. So, and look at this before the test in two weeks, right? Glycolysis, conversion of glucose glycogenesis, producing glycogen, mostly in the liver, but also in a lot of your skeletal muscles. But some, we need glycogen also in your cardiac muscle. Breaking down glycogen, glycogenolysis, we're, we're hydrolyzing, right? Adding water and yielding this other masquerading looking glucose so it can get into the blood and increase your blood glucose like glucagon, right? Glucagon would do that. And now you know cortisol can do this as well. Gluconeogenesis 
and it's producing this glucose 6-phosphate really from non-carbohydrate molecules like lactic acid or amino acids, right? Like that, but also fatty acids. And this all happens in the liver. Now here's the two we didn't mention, or I mentioned, but we really doesn't talk that much about it, but it is important. Lipogenesis is storing your triglycerides like in your fat cells, in your adipose tissue, right? Which is important. Like this is really long-term energy. We can use lipids, as you know, if, if so many people seem to know a lot about nutrition and calories where a, a molecule, a gram of lipid can yield like nine kilocalories as opposed to like protein and carbohydrate, it was more like four kilocalories. And then lipolysis, breaking down. And, and this is not, again, this, this will happen, of course, if you're not eating carbohydrates, because you have to have lipolysis because you need something. You have to store. That's why we store the energy. So eventually we can use it. Like you keep building up that bank account for years and years, and then you run out of money, you have to use the stored money, right? To buy your Popeyes and Chipotle and all that. So that's a breakdown of triglycerides, mainly in that adipose tissue. So ketogenesis is forming these keto bodies and they're four carbons, kind of similar to glucose technically or similar to pyruvate, but of course it's not the same, right? And this comes from breaking down fatty acids, you know, and that occurs in the liver, ketosis. So of course, diabetics would suffer from that Starvation would give you ketogenesis and it goes on and on. So the thing is, you know, it, like, like say, you know, again, it, it kind of makes sense when you talk about diet, right, Chris? Because like you, you kind of know the nutrients, you know what a carbohydrate is, you know what a, what a fat is now, and you know what protein is. So again, you have to have homeostatic balance with all those because if, if you don't, if you have too much protein, in your body, ultimately, well, first of all, it's going to create a lot of um, waste products like urea, which is high nitrogen and it gives your kidneys a little workout. But also, carbohydrates, if you eat excessive carbohydrate, um, you're going to store so much glycogen. You know, there's an, only an infinite amount of glycogen that can be stored. Basically, your liver is going to get really sneaky and it's going to get converted to adipose. Right, so your liver is going to do that, and that's going to change your glycemic index. Then you're going to be like the guy on the TV with the subcutaneous fat, and you're going to be much more chance of having like a uh, type two diabetes. And then you get your A1C checked, right? You heard about A1C because all that glucose is floating around in red blood cells for 120 days, Claire. 120 days, four months. No nucleus, no nucleus, just just some lactate lousy stinky anaerobic respiration, but we need those red blood cells and they get reused for their parts later. We'll learn that later. So where the heck are we? So I like this table. Kat, here's a good study guide for you. Get on it for your next test. And the question's coming if I haven't given it to you already. I don't think I have yet. Let's get through this first. Let's see where we're at. So again, we could use lipids and proteins for energy. I think that we're making that clear. We understand lipids and proteins. We, we don't want to use proteins though. We really don't want to do that. So again, the liver, magical organ. Let's take care of that. And it has to be, and this is a good point. We can't just like, even though ATP is a potential energy, it's used so much for other things that we can't store that ATP. We store glucose, we store fatty acids right, Gly glycogen and adipose, right? So we definitely need to keep making ATP and we need oxygen, of course, so oxygen, ATP, glucose, really important. Yeah, so this again goes back to using lipids because again, pyruvic acid, acetyl-CoA, they produce things like cholesterol, excess cholesterol, because the liver is making cholesterol too, so it can convert some of those lipids to steroids like cholesterol, ketone bodies we already know, and increase the fatty acids. So building lipids 
is lipogenesis. Lipogenesis will increase. So this gets a little um, hard in, in endocrine because like some hormones are gonna cause um, glycogenolysis, but they're gonna call it, they're also gonna cause lipogenesis, which is kind of counteractive. But the thyroid gl uh, gland is, is kind of peculiar in the way it works as it could be anabolic, it could break down lipids, but it can also store carbohydrates. So the hormones, and we're not gonna to talk too much about those hormones yet, because there's a whole big thing I'm gonna do. So fat, store, uh, white fat, um, again, I don't know if you do this in the lab yet, of course not, but adipose white fat is your triglycerides that are storing your um, energy. Right? Oh, here you go, one gram of fat. Nine K cows per gram. So again, lipolysis breaking down the tri uh, uh, triglycerides. Now I'm talking about triglycerides, fats, and using the glycerol to for energy. So when lipolysis happens, you're going to increase the fatty acids in your blood. Right. So that would be more likely if you don't have glucose available to form something like gluconeogenesis. So I guess this is the whole thing with the keto diet with losing weight. And that's why you lose fat so quick on a keto diet because your body's gonna use those fatty acids. It's, first of all, it's gonna cause lipolysis because you need to make ATP with something. There's no glucose available. So gluconeogenesis is part of that process. But along the way, you're gonna develop ketone bodies. So at least they're upfront about the, the ketones. And ketones, I mean, it's very, very efficient. I mean, look at this. Look at this. How much ATP you can get from fat cells. Energy, right? Energy. So just to show you the, and beta oxidation, again, this, this is basically what happens, combusting the fat cells to be used as a fuel, like pyruvic acid, converted to pyruvic acid. So of course you get more. This is healthy. Um, adipose tissue, brown fat, which children have a lot of this, but adults, not so much, All right? And newborn, of course, that's used for a body temperature. So it also helps. I mean, your metabolism is better. The more brown fat you have as an adult genetically. So this is a good uh, research right here to increase maybe longevity, maybe increase your, your cellular cycles. So brown fat, Hopefully over the years, we'll evolve to have more brown fat, but we gotta be careful. Look at this, sympathetic nervous system. Norepinephrine causes brown fat to uncouple. We don't have to know the protein and you get more ATP formed because when, you, when you're in sympathetic mode, you really, you know, you have, you have to make ATP, right? You have to, so here, here's a good point. Sympathetic, right? I went back to this before. You mentioned cortisol. So you're going to increase your gluconeogenesis with sympathetic. So here's now here, here, here we're getting like a neuroendocrine production here with the nervous system affecting the endocrine system, which is really what I like to talk about. So when you're in sympathetic stimulation, you're more likely to have uh, glycogenolysis, right? Makes sense, especially, you know, even without the cortisol, even without the cortisol, because when I'm eating the burrito in the park here, right? And I'm, I'm in parasympathetic because I'm digesting. It's my, my esophagus is working good. My stomach, my uh, pancreatic amylase and trypsin all working good. But then the, then the, the coyote comes. It's a coyote, right? Coyote that you, so now once the coyote comes in, the first thing is the nervous system. The nervous system is faster than endocrine. You know, okay, okay. Well, gonna, am I gonna go through puberty today or what? what what's gonna happen? So, but the, the nervous system immediate, so norepinephrine is released right away to get your heart rate increased by affecting the SA node to get oxygen to your brain quicker by increasing your blood pressure and heart rate. So I can make the decision, am I gonna eat this burrito? Am I gonna fight the coyote? Or am I gonna run away? I think the answer is clear. I'm gonna eat the burrito, right Gabriel? I'm gonna eat the burrito. <laughs> so the sympathetic nervous, the, the neuron, uh, function is quick, lightning, right? But then the cortisol, again, the cor what's the cortisol coming? You, know, you gotta wait another few minutes before cortisol can affect you. Um, but thank goodness we have this adrenal gland where 
the nervous system stimulates the adrenal gland and we get this hormone, which is the same as epinephrine. It's called adrenaline, adrenaline. So now my blood sugar is going to go up because I have to free up the glycogen in case I want to run away from the coyote, right? And I got to make that decision. So then, you know, then all of a sudden everything is cool. So, you know, the park, the, whatever the, the park police, they took away the coyote, coyote safe. I'm happy. So I can go back to my burrito and I'm not, you know, the blood starting to go back to my, um, <clears throat> to my digestive organs, but my heart is still beating. My heart is still beating fast, even as I'm eating my burrito. Why is that? Why, what, what caused that delayed response, the nervous system or the endocrine system, the delayed response? Okay. The hormone, because the adrenaline is a slow acting, slow acting and a slow chemical messenger. So, so your heart will continue to beat because of the um, slow release of, well, and adrenaline, which is the same as epinephrine. It's the same thing, really. It's just a hormonal form. So endocrine, of course, is released into the blood, which is slow production. So you kind of understand that? But at the same time, my, my blood sugar is going up. Yeah, and, and not just from the burrito, by the way. And I save the lollipop for later, just so I get a little extra sugar. Okay, so let's move on a little bit before we take a break. Ketone bodies, excess lipolysis, so increase of fatty acids in the blood, or if you're dieting, <clears throat> heavy dieting, like the you know, no carb diet, which is Atkins, Atkins, I think it was called, before keto diet was Atkins, where you didn't eat any carbohydrates, kind of like the keto diet. Starvation, not eating anything. You're going to use your storage form first, which is the, the lipids, the stored lipids in the adipose, white fat. Or if you can't use glucose for your diabetes. Diabetes mellitus type 1, you can't make insulin. Diabetes type 2 is you can't use the insulin. So either way, you're not getting glucose into your cells efficiently and your blood glucose goes high. So you're gonna have to rely on fatty acid metabolism to make ATP. So the liver, our friend, the liver, the manufacturer will start to use beta oxidation and use the acetyl-CoA. And then the outcome or byproduct is these ketone bodies, which can lead to acidosis or ketosis. First ketosis, where you know, kind of giving off a chemical toxic chemical like kind of like acetone if you ever smelled something like um nail polish remover nail polish remover has that smell and that that's pretty much what somebody smells like when they're in ketosis you can actually smell that 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 chemical because you you know, olfactory sensor chemoreceptors can pick up that chemical of of ketones which is very very similar to acetone which you might have seen in the lab or or, or you heard in lab on a video or, or picture or a uh, conference call. So amino acids, we don't want to use these. Of course, we don't want to use these. So your dietary proteins can be used, right? They can be used for energy and they can be converted to carbohydrates or fat. That's why excessive protein in your diet will ultimately be stored, not as carbohydrates so much, but more as adipose. And same thing if you have too many carbohydrates in your diet, uh, in the absence of diabetes or starvation, of course, then your excess calories from carbohydrate, not the calories, but the excess carbohydrate molecules themselves will be converted to lipids in the liver. So this, I wanted to bring this up. I, I, this should have been in the chemistry, like the whole chapter, I think it was chapter six. I'm kind of skipping over because we did all that in chemistry. We spent a lot of time on diffusion and extracellular fluid. So I want to get into these systems now, the nervous system, especially. So they really didn't talk about the essential amino acids. Like our bodies make 12, so we have to make at least uh, eight or nine amino acids that we have to have into our diet. We have to, eat, we have to eat those essential amino acids and we need them. They're, they are essential to, for your cycles and, and to build those proteins. So anything that has to come from the diet, any of those amino acids are called essential amino acids. So there's kind of a good list here. And it's, it's impossible to memorize all of these and you don't have to. 
for this class, but it's good to know, like you might've heard of these, like we talked about phenylalanine with the phenylketonurics, tryptophan you might've heard of in certain things like um, meat, maybe Popeyes, you can get a little tryptophan, turkey, I think, and, and threonine and valine, methionine, really important and it's essential. You really need this to, to, for transcription purposes and codons and leucine, isoleucine and histidine, which is more important in children. Right? And these are the ones that your body makes, glutamic acid. Just get used to the names, glycine. I'm going to bring this up, glycine, because a lot of these, not a lot of them, but some of these um, amino acids can be used as like a neurotransmitter. Like glycine can act as a neurotransmitter. And it's a non-essential amino acid. Glutamine, which can make glutamate, right? which is another amino acid. Tyrosine, important in manufacturing thyroid hormone. Tryptophan used to make other neurotransmitters like serotonin and um, norepinephrine and dopamine. So it's important to, to kind of remember the names. Uh, of course, I might you know just give you some questions that so you can help you learn uh, what the amino acids are and, and the ones that are essential versus non-essential and the whole idea of that. So this is pretty much of using an amino acid to go into the liver to be converted to something like a pyruvic acid. So urea, uh, we're gonna talk about that a lot when we do um, talk about the urinary system because urea is, is the waste product of protein metabolism. So again, using excess amino acids or breaking down excessive amino acids, first of all, you're cannibalizing yourself. You're using your own structure to make ATP. But urea is, is, is appropriate though. You need a urea in your kidney to balance your osmotic pressure, but excessive nitrogen can, in, from amino acids, like an amine group, will create high levels of urea, which will really kind of be toxic to the kidney and of course the liver too. So this is you know, just showing how these amino acids can be used and hydrolyzed into acetyl-CoA right, or pyruvic acid and then be put into the Krebs cycle to make get the ATP which and the NADH and FAD to be used to make ATP. So also the byproducts of this as well, but most of which is excess urea, a high nitrogen uh, waste product of protein metabolism that's really excessive uh, workout for your kidneys. So yeah, the liver, I think we got this down now, right? The liver, glycogen, ketone bodies that are manufactured in the liver in the absence of glucose, pretty much. Your fatty acids are stored in your adipose tissue. Your fat cells are adipocytes. White fat, right? White fat used for energy, high KCAL um, production. And of course, amino acids are coming from your own body tissue, your muscles. And whatever lactic acid is available after anaerobic respiration or fermentation can be used as energy. Lactic acid is completely appropriate too. And, that, and that's, that's a pretty um, efficient way of using. So this is just showing you the three places. You know, you're using stored glucose in the form of glycogen. You're using your white adipose cells, your white fat adipose cells, which you know everybody has adipose cells in appropriate places and then your protein. And you can see how ultimately it will enter the Krebs cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle or the citric acid cycle. So this is a pretty good slide. I kept this one here. I think it's good for a little visual and it, you, you won't forget it, I promise. I like this one too. I like this, the importance of using these things. And look at this, I, I might've mentioned this, like glucose, of course, the brain and, and insulin is like one of the only hormones that can get into the brain and glucagon, of course, of course. I mean, skeletal muscle, of course, we wanna use glucose. Liver, we're using glucose as we're manufacturing glycogen. Heart muscle wants to use glucose, but you could use ketone body. So this is where they are appropriate. Like I told you last time, I think you could use your ketone bodies for brain synapse function, ATP. Skeletal muscle, of course, of course, skeletal muscle and 
And the liver loves to make things. So it's going to take the ketones and convert it. And the heart, of course, is, is a place where we really need oxygen or else the blood's not going to get pumped to the brain. So the liver and the heart will take the skeletal muscle, lactic acid, and it really don't want to, I mentioned this before, you really don't want to use lactic acid. When that happens and you see LDH, the, um, the enzyme converting the lactic acid in the muscle, if you see that in the blood, you know there might be some type of myocardial infarction. But the brain, no, no, no. Um, lactic acid, no lactic acid there. That is completely glucose, a lot of glucose. And sometimes we can use ketones and it's good for the brain, but in short spurts, right? And under the direction of a neurologist, of course. So that would really make sense. You're gonna love it. I love it already. Okay, here we go. The nervous system. The nervous system. What are we talking about here? This is a system. We're doing a system. Congratulations, everyone. So this is nervous tissue. And nervous tissue, you know, first thing that comes to my mind is excitable. Where you have a membrane. Remember the cell membrane and the muscle membrane and the nervous tissue membrane, the neuron. First of all, the neuron is the main functional cell has an excitable membrane, which means it's very sensitive to influx of sodium and needs a stimulus and an and electric, right? Electric, that's another thing, electric and very fast. So I'll use words like conduction, impulse, things like that is um, talking about the movement of ions along the membrane, causing a change somewhere and a very rapid change. So there's two different types of cells. Most of the um, nervous tissue cells are the supporting cells, which are called glial cells. Glial cells are the supportive cells of the nervous system. And there's, there's six total that we'll learn. But the neuron, that is the functional cell. And one of the big differences you should know that a neuron does not have a lot of centriol, so it's not undergoing mitosis, where glial cells are, are mitotic. They're producing things kind of like an epithelial tissue, which is much more mitotic. So nervous tissue is its own tissue. Remember the four tissue types? So nervous tissue, mostly talking about neurons when we talk about those tissue types. So the CNS, you'll hear me say CNS, and this is easy one to remember. It's probably the easiest thing. Just keep remembering, central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. You know the brain, that's that, that big like cauliflower looking thing with a stem on it, which is protected by your cranial bones of your skull. The spinal cord runs downward, uh, distal or inferior to the brain. Of course, we're, we're bipeds as far as I know, so our brains are more vertical. So the brain stem will tend to lead to the spinal cord going vertically inferior. Inferior means below. And this is protected by the vertebral column, those 24 movable vertebrae. The PNS is everything else outside. So you're gonna hear about cranial nerves. There's 12 pairs of these pairs. So it's on both sides, very nuts and bolts the PNS, it's like, it's like a wiring system in your house. And the spinal nerves, there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And you might remember, if you ever had this before, like the nerves in your neck or the vertebrae in your neck are called cervical. So it starts with the brain, which is CNS, right? I'll draw this out. Then you have the brain stem, and there's parts in between I'm gonna go through. Still the brain, the brain stem is still the brain. And then you have, then that's CNS, the brain and, oh, well, I'm sorry, that's in the skull. Then you have the spinal cord, which has divisions on top called cervical. And there's eight paired spinal nerves. And then you have thoracic. And then lumbar and sacral. I'm just talking about the nerves, not really the bone. And then you have 
There's like one coccygeal nerve. So these are all the divisions of the spinal cord. So this all is the CNS. And then the nerves will branch from both sides into the PNS. Uh, eight thoracic, I'm sorry, eight cervical nerves paired, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal, going to different places. So that's basically the, the number one thing you should know, the difference between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the nervous tissue is two types, the neurons that have that excitable membrane that are conductive, send the impulse. Do not divide, amitotic. And the glial cells, also called neuroglial, are supportive. So we'll have to go through each one of them, six. There's four in the CNS and there's two in the PNS. I love the tables, just to give you a little, whenever you go into a study questions or quiz or an exam, you should really take a look at these, these tables because it gives you the terminology. So I, I just want to go through these kind of quickly. Um, central nervous system right away, you know, it's brain and spinal cord. For PNS, peripheral nervous system, is anything outside. And we'll get into what a ganglia is or a plexus. You already know about the nerves, the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. And then there's different types of neurons. So basically you have the sensory neuron and this neuron is called afferent. And you should know that afferent means coming into the CNS. And that makes sense, right? A sensory neuron, sensory nerve is coming from somewhere where there's a receptor. Right? Something that, that's receiving an impulse like pain right, on your fingers or vision in your retina. That's all afferent because it's all eventually going to come into the CNS except for a reflex. Well, even a reflex goes into the spinal cord, but it's all coming in sensory afferent into the uh, CNS. And motor is the opposite, an efferent neuron. That's out of the CNS. And that produces a motor function like a contraction of a muscle or a release of a gland, something from a gland that's released. So that's coming from or out of the CNS. And sometimes there's an in-between, pretty much all the time, there's, except for a couple of places, you have an integrating or association neuron that communicates between neurons, sometimes right between a sensory and motor, an afferent and efferent. So these are neurons. Now, this is talking about neurons. So if you use the term nerve, a nerve could be both, actually all three. A nerve could have a sensory and motor neuron, and most of them do. All your spinal nerves have both sensory neurons and motor neurons. So that's important, you know, the terminology. And sometimes we use them interchangeably, which is really incorrect. You really have to say, and when you say nerve, you, you know, you can't just say sensory nerve or sensory or motor nerve. You basically have to say that nerve contains motor neurons and sensory neurons, not usually interneurons, because interneurons, I should tell you, are in the CNS only. So those are only in the brain and spinal cord, which are really important. So I like to start out telling you the difference between sensory and motor neurons. Yeah, cable-like, you know, it's very nuts and bolts. Like you ever hear of the sciatic nerve? Sciatic nerve is a huge posterior nerve that's made up of lumbar and sacral nerve roots that has sensory and motor. So you, it gives you sensation of the posterior leg, the buttocks, and it's motor to your hamstrings where it makes your skeletal muscles behind your thigh contract. So it's got functions of sensory and motor, but it's a nerve, all right? And then now the difference between somatic and autonomic, this is really important. And this, I, we should might as well get it done now. Let's get it done just so you have the definition. 
autonomic is something that you don't have any voluntary control, of course. There's no voluntary control. So autonomic is more about your, your heart, your blood vessels, your, your glands, autonomic. Where somatic is more about <coughs> moving muscles that we have voluntary control over. Also, you could say somatic senses like pain, touch, vibration, tickle, <coughs> temperature, and all your special senses as well. Special senses are your hearing, your vestibular, which means your balance, <coughs> your vision, um, your olfaction, which is another term for taste. Uh, I'm sorry, for smell. Gustation is taste. So you have those five senses that are somatic. They're somatic senses, but autonomic is your heart, <coughs> your blood vessels. So if you remember, when we talked about feedback mechanisms, there's an effector, right? Effector is pretty much the area of the body that is going to get the job done. So the autonomic nervous system has three effectors, smooth muscle, which is mostly your blood vessels, but also your gastrointestinal system. Cardiac muscle, which makes up your whole heart <coughs> and glands. So the effectors of the autonomic nervous system are smooth muscle, involuntary, cardiac muscle, involuntary, thank God, and glands, involuntary. So I, I, I'm feeling pretty good about saying involuntary when it comes to motor. And there is some sensory, autonomic sensory. And there's also, of course, a somatic sensory as well. But this is easier to explain your motor to the effector. So now the effector for the somatic nervous system is only one place, your voluntary muscle, your skeletal muscles. So anything that's somatic, when you decide to kick a football, when I tap you on the knee to elicit a reflex, it's a somatic reflex, but autonomic has to do with those two things. Remember me eating my burrito in the park? Mm -hmm. That's parasympathetic is one branch, rest or digest. And then there's sympathetic, which is fight or flight. So th this is definitely a Shakespearean tragedy between these two, right? There's only like one or two places where they kind of work together and shake hands. Otherwise, it's almost completely opposite. Like I, I mentioned neurotransmitter. Let's talk about this now. Why not? Parasympathetic is going to use a neurotransmitter at, at the effector. Let me get that effector. Like skeletal muscle, it's going to use acetylcholine at the effector. Autonomic has both. Parasympathetic is going to use what's called acetylcholine. Sympathetic is going to use what's called norepinephrine. Okay, so pretty much every place is like that. At the effector, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. There's only one place where acetylcholine is used in the sympathetic nervous system, and that's to the effect of a sweat gland. Otherwise, it's all norepinephrine for sympathetic. But parasympathetic is all acetylcholine. So those are neurotransmitters, and we're going to go into that with great detail. And the difference between, and this is just terminology, a ganglion is a group of neuronal cell bodies in outside the, the CNS. Nucleus or nuclei is inside the C CNS. And we have to tell you what a cell body is too. I have to show you what the neuron looks like if you've never seen it before. A tract is usually a very long, or it doesn't always have to be long, but usually a long tract either coming afferent into the CNS or efferent coming out of the CNS. So it has to travel, right? It has to travel to the brain many times. So a tract is like a group of neurons within the CNS for the most part. And it really is, it's only in the CNS. So it's different than a nerve because the nerves are PNS. Let's write that, there we go, PNS, and they all are. So that's a really important fact. So just to get the terminology down as we're going through this, and just me, at least we don't hear that table saw anymore. 
So always a good thing to go through these. Other question that maybe a little bit off base, but like, what about spinal fluid? Like, yeah, yeah, cerebral spinal fluid, uh, CSF is, it's really, its function is mostly protection and it pretty much flows through the layers of the CNS, brain and spinal cord. So what, happens, some, so what happens in a case, like in a rare case, like, like Chiari uh, malformation? Or the Arnold Chiari syndrome? Yeah. Yeah, that, that would create a lot of uh, edema in certain parts of your brain. And it'll function so and it'll, it'll lose function it's almost like having a tumor it's so it's so destructive so it it, it it does need to be surgically treated yes yes or put it or a shunt can be put in which is also surgery yeah so what we yeah, will get to the cerebral spinal fluid is you know of course the skull protects the brain and the ver the vertebrae to protect the spinal cord but it's all surrounded by a running fluid called cerebral spinal fluid which also acts for protection, acts as protection, insulation. It provides some uh, glucose. It provides a lot of uh, maybe some antibacterial or immune cells, a little bit of lipid. But really, it, 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 if you're injured, like a head injury, is, it, we're still very vulnerable to head injuries if, if the cerebrospinal fluid gets affected, let alone something a horrible genetic that could affect the... Uh, the area is genetic, right? Yeah. It is? Yeah. yeah. Arnold QR, QRE is anyway. Okay. So neurons. Let's take a look. I could draw it for you. You know, that again, that'll wind up in the in the Whitney. Let me just draw it real quick. Let's see. This is kind of what a neuron looks like. It, it looks like no other cell. So if you look at the histology of a neuron, it kind of looks like this. And then it has like branches on the bottom. This of course is not drawn to scale, but it will wind up in the Met probably after this class. <laughs> so a neuron has these little arm-like projections or tree-like branches, and they're called dendrites, which means tree-like. And you'll see this again, but the dendrites are more about incoming information into the neuron, like from another neuron, usually, almost always, unless it's an external sensory neuron. So dendrites pretty much are about incoming electrical signals. And this whole part right up here is called the soma or the cell body. And that's what we were talking about before, cell body. And this long extension, sometimes it's long, sometimes it's short, um, sometimes it's in between. The long process, and, so, and sometimes we'll call these nerve fibers are called axons, or axon, in this case is one neuron. Sometimes the axon has some cells around it, which are neuroglial cells, which we'll talk about. Sometimes not, like a motor neuron outside the PN, uh, outside the CNS or sensory neuron outside the CNS always has these cells, these glial cells, supportive cells. And I like this area right here. This is like the end of the neuron and, and it's called the axon terminal. It has other names too, axon terminal. So most of the time, the information, which is um, depolarization, right? Which I mentioned a lot when we did chemistry and membrane, Depolarization is in one direction in, in one particular neuron. It's always going from the cell body or from the dendrites to the cell body to the axon out to the terminals. And at the terminals is where the neurotransmitters are released to either another neuron, right? Or if it's a somatic motor neuron, it's gonna be releasing acetylcholine neurotransmitter to the skeletal muscle. If it's an autonomic, motor neuron, it's, it may be releasing norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter to the heart, or to your blood vessels, or to a gland. So it depends if autonomic is sympathetic and parasympathetic. So they all have the basically the same parts, but every, every <clears throat> like a sensory neuron, motor neuron, interneuron, and a special sense neuron have a, a little different qualities, which I'll take you through. So the chemical part of of neuron 
transmission, if you will, and what it responds to is usually like an odor, let's say a smell, a chemical receptor in your, your nose, basically in your nasal cavity for olfaction or taste buds respond to chemical uh, flavors in food. Physical stimuli could be heat or pain or something painful that destroys tissue like a nail going into your finger or fine touch or pressure or vibration. So that's what really depolarizes these dendrites to send a signal into the CNS ultimately so you know what you're feeling. Right? You know if you're feeling pain, you know if you're feeling temperature, although those two pathways kind of get crisscrossed. So chemical versus physical, and it, it has to do with, with the receptors. Receptor, I talk a lot about receptors too. And the electrochemical impulse is perfectly said, that's conduction. So electrochemical impulses is basically about sodium influx, which will give you what's called depolarization. And that's what excites a neuron because inside the cell, it's very negative at rest. So sodium coming in will depolarize the membrane. The chemical regulators are acetylcholine type of chemicals or norepinephrine, and they're called neurotransmitters. So neurons have a chemical release and of course an electro or electric release or voltage release, if you will. So stimuli, of course, comes from inside or outside in the brain, storing information in the form of learning with memory. And then motor, of course, moving muscles and having your glands secrete whatever they're, they're making. Yeah, most cannot divide, but some can be repaired. Not everywhere, but for the most part. In the PNS, it's much more repairable than the CNS. So if you do have a brain injury, the neurons of your brain are destroyed, they, they don't repair so quick. If you injure a neuron in a nerve in the PNS, they have more supportive cells that act to repair that particular function of that, those neurons. So there's, there's limited repair compared to a muscle though. Okay, so back to the neuron. I hope we see a picture soon because my picture is the best though. There's not saying nothing's gonna be better. So we have a question? Yeah, if you have, um, let's say like you lose neurons, if you have uh, nervous tissue, well, you lose nervous tissue, some of the neurons die uh, in certain pathways. If you strengthen that pathway, do the other neurons kind of like strengthen themselves like they take over the, the motor pools that you lost? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, and in the PNS, not so much. Not so much. So if you injure, you know, if really badly injure a, a PNS nerve and then your motor, let's say your motor neurons are affected, you'll only get so much regeneration thanks to the supportive cells. Now, yes. the brain, if your brain neurons are affected, that's going to affect a lot more, right? I mean, if, if my um, brachial, order, uh, brachial nerve is affected, I may lose control of my hands. And, and it depends on the degree of damage as well. If the nerves are pretty big. It depends where too. Um, so it, you ever hear of carpal tunnel syndrome? That's something everybody probably heard of, right? You know, carpal tunnel. I, I have it because I'm always eating Popeyes and opening bottles of Tito's, of course. So the carpal tunnel syndrome is probably overdiagnosed too, because a true carpal tunnel syndrome is an impingement of what's called the median nerve in your wrist. And, and there's, there's a, a bone, a carpal, which I have no idea why we have eight carpals in our hand. It makes no sense to me at all. But let's say the capitate or is, is blocking the tunnel where the nerve comes out. So you may get uh, tingling in these three fingers, one, two, and three, thumb to the middle finger. So it depends on how much inflammation is around that. And, and, and is, the, is the nerve really destroyed? It's not really destroyed. It's just inflamed or, you know, it's not, hasn't been cut. 
Now, now, if you go to a really bad surgeon, like, you know, if you don't go to, you know, HSS, instead you go to the local bodega to get your carpal tunnel surgery, they're probably going to cut one of the other nerves, like say the radial nerve, which goes to your thumb. Now, if that's cut, you say bye-bye to your, to your feeling in your thumb. You say bye-bye to moving your thumb. Then, then I'm just like the gibbon down in Kenya. I can't do anything. I can't, use, I can't oppose my fingers because those muscles are, are bye-bye. So it depends on the degree of injury. And will that come back after Carlos at the bodega cut my radial nerve? No, no. It doesn't matter how much you know, glial cells will try to regenerate. You might get a little bit of movement. You go to physiotherapy for three years. You know, I light a candle with Buddha, whatever. It, it'll, it'll, it'll try to come back and you'll get some faculties back. Maybe, maybe the sensation will come back a little bit because of the collateral nerve um, innervation, but no. Now in the brain, if, you, if your neurons die in your brain, good night, that's it. You know, especially specific ones. Say you have a stroke and a stroke is a cerebrovascular accident where you, you lack blood flow to one part of your brain. So like if that happens to your right side of your brain, you have a, a, a blood clot in your carotid artery that, that blocks blood going, or even deeper, like even deeper above your carotid artery in, in the circle of Willis. And one of the communicating arteries is blocked. It's going to there's no oxygen getting to those, that tissue. It is hypoxia, there's ischemia, there's death, infarction of that, those nerves, those neurons, sorry. See, I always do that. Those neurons. So they're not coming back to specific areas. Now, if you get to it in time, if you, you notice something like all of a sudden, uh, you know, you, you can't, and, and this is the right side of the brain, I can't use my left hand. I can't, I can't move my left hand. And even my left leg is feeling a little bit weak. Now, if you get there in time, you might be able to, to perfuse that blood. Um, you would have to do surgery, of course, or of course, go right on blood thinners and, and any, any um, quick acting anticoagulants and, and see if you can keep the blood perfusing with the oxygen to that area to prevent any further damage. But here's the catch. Like you may lose some of those faculties, but that's, it depends on the population of neurons that were destroyed. Now in the brain, there's synapses that we never use, right? That we never use. Like, and and if you go to the you know the phys physiotherapy, you go to HSS instead of going to Popeyes for physiotherapy, of course, and they do certain not only cognitive physiotherapy but also physical therapy, occupational therapy, where you can build new pathways in your brain. You can build new, and we'll talk about synapses. And so there's some plasticity. Plasticity is not really new neurons in, in your cerebral cortex or your, your cerebrum, but plasticity is, is finding new pathways to get the job done. You know, like, like Stevie Wonder, who's blind, he can't see, but his brain mapping is probably much more sensitive to his fingers and the sense of touch, you know, especially if it's, if it's um, reinforced. You know, I, you hear stories about people who have strokes and they can't move their leg, but they just keep trying and trying and, and find a way. So there, there is uh, new pathways and plasticity that can happen. But the, the nerves that are dead at this point um, are not coming back. But there's, of course, research where you could take hip, hippocampal uh, nerves, uh, neurons, I'm sorry. And they have some stem cell production and they have some mitosis. So there's hope for that. But pretty much, yeah, bye-bye to the nerves if they're uh, completely destroyed. So that's a, it's a good point when you're learning about the nervous system too to know you know what goes wrong and that's that's how we found out all this stuff you know but this is just the nuts and bolts of what a neuron looks like the shape the cell body key point uh, nissel bodies I just like the way this guy's name is spelled and th these are basically ribosomes like chromatin really so some DNA ribosomes histones. Because you need proteins, right? In, 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 in the neurons, it's really important. You're building proteins to keep the shape of the neuron. And we'll talk about those and how that relates to head injuries or Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So DNA and some histones. So they're building proteins, as you know. That's what all this is about, DNA, histones. So it's in the cell body. I should have drew that before. Now, if you have a group of cell bodies, right? A group of cell bodies in the CNS, 
It's called the nuclei. All right, um, and it's hard to give you an example now. You may have heard of the basal nuclei, which I used to call ganglia. Everybody did. So cell bodies clustered in the PNS are called ganglia. And then the dendrites I showed you are those tree-like limbs that are coming into the cell body. So they're technically they're an extension of the cell body, but it's about incoming to the dendrite and toward the cell body. And the axon will conduct that impulse away from the cell body. That's usually called the nerve or neuron fiber. So away from the cell body to the axon terminal. Oh, come on, I drew much better than this, All right? So A is kind of an example of what most um, motor neurons look like. And these are called multipolar. This is a multipolar neuron and mostly motor neuron and interneuron or integrative neuron. That's what they look like when you have the cell body, pretty, pretty much the one we see all the time in the textbooks. <clears throat> and this one here is called a unipolar or some books will call it a pseudo unipolar. But I'll just call it a unipolar. Neuron, and this is just has extensions. The cell body is kind of in the middle, and the extensions are here. So the information is still coming in from the dendrites. Now they say dendrites here. So these are the dendrites. These are your axon terminals. So, and unipolar are always sensory, somatic sensory usually too. But sensory. So this one is more of a motor neuron. So here's the cell body. All of this is the cell body. And here's your dendrites, the tree-like projections. There could be 10 of these, there could be a thousand of these on a cell body. All bringing information in. And usually from, an, and usually from a neuron, another neuron, or from outside, like from a, a pain area or fingertips and the skin, right? Where you have sensory receptors. Well, sensory receptors are generally part of the dendrite. And I'll explain that when we get to those senses. And then you have the axon terminals here. Now, this is a, now again, I'm sorry, this is a motor neuron. So it, it's, it works the same way. It works the same way if this was the pain and the temperature. So I'm sorry, I missed those up. But sometimes the books do that and they just give you a motor neuron, but I just wanna make sure you know a, un a multipolar is motor or interneuron. So this information, so where, where do you think? Like, here's a good question. Like this is a motor neuron, right? And here's your dendrite. Now, neurons never actually touch. There's always a cleft between the dendrite and an incoming neuron. So if, here's a really good question about motor. And I remember I said motor is efferent going out of the CNS. So, so I, wanna, I wanna use my pen, right? I wanna write with my pen. So I, I do have to start this from my left side. It does cross over. So where does that impulse start? Like if I wanna use my pen, which I'm moving skeletal muscles, where does that impulse start? It's descending, it's efferent, it's motor. It starts, yeah, in, in, in your cerebral cortex. Do you, it's voluntary because it's a somatic, right? But it starts on the left side because those tracks are gonna cross over. So I don't know how that happens. I can't explain how that happens. You know, the, it's a ghost in the machine. They just, you, you think about doing something voluntarily through volition and your muscles contract. I, I, I don't know how they're depolarized how those cell bodies in my cerebral cortex, gray matter, send that signal, it just works, right? I don't know. I don't, I've been working with mice for years, I still don't know. But ultimately, through a series of motor neurons, usually only two or three, like one interneuron and one neuron in the PNS, going to my hand muscles to, to contract, releasing acetylcholine and off it goes. And then it stops. It's crazy, I don't understand it but it's all descending. It's all coming from a motor neuron. And they never, they never touch, they never touch. So 
there's a, a projection off of the neuron called an axon, and these are covered by glial cells. And if if this is and this is and I should say this is all PNS what we're looking at here to be completely um, accurate. So these cells are called Schwann cells. And they're a type of neuroglial cell that make and have myelin. Myelin is what makes white matter white. And we'll learn about myelin as myelin speeds up the conduction. So this way, you know, when the, when the information comes from my cerebral cortex, move the pen and then it depolarizes the membrane and all of a sudden it just jumps, the depolarization jumps across a membrane on top of these Schwann cells from node to node and gets there really quick. And then I can move my pen or do whatever, run away from, the, um, we're talking about somatic, so I'm not running away from any coyotes now, I'm just writing or kicking a football. And the same thing with the PNS sensory nerve or neuron, there you go again. So if, if I step on a nail in the park, that's a nail, you know, and, and I'm barefoot, I have, I could, I have a receptor for pain, which is basically a free nerve ending dendrite, bringing in that information. And again, Schwann cells and the depolarization jumps over the Schwann cells, takes a break in the, see that in the cell body, which is unipolar, and then goes into the spinal cord and goes to the other side of my brain. If I step, if I step on a um, a nail with my right foot, the left side of my cerebral cortex, my cerebrum is going to tell me that's a nail, you know, and there's a reflex to that too, but, but I still have to know I stepped on a nail. So that's, that reaches my consciousness. So I'm cognitive through somatic and that's sensory coming into the CNS. So they basically have the same parts, just a little bit different configuration, sensory and motor afferent versus efferent. You should really get that down. <clears throat> Axons are those projections away from the cell body. And, 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 feel, and think of it as a one direction right now. Right? And they vary in length from a few millimeters, right? because inter, an interneuron could be just a couple of millimeters between two neurons. And, and some axons are as long as a meter. And there's really only one place that the, an axon is like a yard long. And that's, that's a sciatic nerve. That's a really long nerve. So that has a lot of neurons that are really long within it. Because remember, the sciatic is a nerve and that contains both motor and sensory. So the sensory and motor neurons in the sciatic nerve are really long. And that, that may involve you know, some pain, may involve moving a muscle, your calf muscles, gastrocnemius or your hamstring. So some uh, different varying lengths. Of course, the ones that connect parts of your brain are very small as well, just um, associating different parts of your brain, which we'll learn when we do the CNS. Yeah. So am I going to have to go back and draw? Let me go back. Let me just go back to this picture, save you time. So right here, right where the cell body meets the axon, this is like a general term, uh, the word hillock. It's called the axon hillock. And a hillock or hilum is basically any exiting or entry to either an organ or in this case, the cell body. So the axon hillock is basically where the axon starts off of the cell body. So that's where it's connected. So the axon hillock is an area that's gonna decide and summate all the input to see if, if we're gonna go ahead and have an action potential. So we got to talk about action potential, right? We talk about what that is. That's after depolarization. And, you, and as you saw in the um, multipolar neuron, we have collaterals, different branching. That's just branching off of one neuron from its axon. So multiple directions, having different synapses with other places, depends on where it is. Oh, I love this name too, the nodes of Ranvier. The nodes of Ranvier, we speak French now. So these little nodes between the Schwann cells, all of them, right in here, and here, 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 they're called your nodes of Ranvier. I wonder if uh, Ranvier and Nissel ever met. That'd be really interesting. Or Schwann. 
So the nodes are between Schwann cells, between the myelin, and that's where you have many populations of sodium channels, which allow for faster depolarization as that impulse speeds through from node to node. It jumps from node to node. And later on, you're gonna hear that's called saltatory conduction, which doesn't happen if myelin is not there. So there are unmyelinated fibers or axons. So axonal transport. Active process, which means you're gonna need some ATP. So guess what? You're gonna need a lot of oxygen, right? So it's a an, it's an very important um, oxygen delivery. I think 20% of our oxygen in our body is used by the brain, right? <clears throat> so you need fast channels, sodium, right? Sodium, you also need vesicular and the vesicles are gonna be about your neurotransmitters. Exocytosis, if you remember that. So your neurotransmitters are stored in vesicles. And here's what I was talking about before. Why do you need all that protein building? Like this is electric. Of course you do have receptors, but you have these microfilaments which add to the structure and microtubules, which are bigger than microfilaments that are protein structure of a neuron. And the proteins, of course, keep the osmotic pressure consistent. So let me go back to that in a minute, but um, answer grade transport means that things are moving in a, a, a forward direction, all right, forward direction from the cell body, dendrites, and then down the axon. Okay, kinescent, don't worry about that. Retrograde is a opposite to the cell body. So again, these are different proteins that are used and we're not really gonna talk about that, dynin or kinescent. Another close-up, parts of the neuron. <clears throat> these would be dendrites right here, dendrites. And of course, I didn't mention the nucleus, of course, that's what really gives it away, that it's the um, cell body is the, the large staining nucleus, if you look at histology. And usually the nissel bodies or nissel substances are kind of scattered out like chromatin within the cell body. And of course, there's gonna be a lot of mitochondria in here. It's gonna be a lot of mitochondria in here too. It's all over the place because we gotta make ATP. And this is the axon hillock right here. And this is called the initial segment of the axon, which is right below the axon hillock. Here's your myelinated cells, your Schwann cells in the PNS. And these are your nodes of Ranvier. So you see how the axon is kind of wrapped up in this myelin, which is produced by the Schwann cells in the, in the PNS. There's a different glial cell in the CNS that produces myelin. Myelin is that white matter. Gray matter, which we might as well talk about it. Gray matter is just cell bodies or unmyelinated fibers. So the gray, when you hear the term gray matter of the spinal cord or gray matter of the cerebrum, like the cerebral cortex, the outer part, cortex means outer or bark. That's mostly cell bodies. So you have the, the dendrites, part of the gray matter, the nucleus, the nissel bodies, all the cell bodies are gray matter. So it looks great physically to the naked eye, it looks great. And the fibers or the axons that are myelinated looks like white matter and it matters, it sure does. Okay, so just looking at the different parts of the neuron. So this test will have the parts of the neuron on it as well as all the other stuff we did since the last exam. So let's see how far we get in the next couple of minutes. And of course, the diff, you know, what the, what the CNS is, what the PNS is, things like that. So we're not gonna get too far today, but it's a good introduction. So back to functional classification of neurons. Oh, I wanted to tell you one thing though, I'm sorry. Why, and it'll go into this later, but why is this so important? <clears throat> you know, structurally making these proteins and these are made of proteins too. These are made of proteins microfilaments and microtubules especially. So if you have some type of genetic problem making the microtubules, it could lead to you know, malformed plaques of proteins or neurofibrillary tangles, which could lead to things like dementia. So usually Alzheimer's 
gets a kind of a, a placking of buildup of bad proteins that blocks the connection between neurons. And the connection between two neurons is called a synapse. Because remember I said the neurons never really touch. So the space between two neurons is called the synaptic cleft. So we'll get to those terms. And don't worry about that anti-grade, um, retrograde flow yet until we talk about other pathologies. So it's, you really have to get the basics down first. <clears throat> so here's the functional, we talked about this already. Sensory is incoming to the CNS. So into the CNS and anything that comes into a structure or the CNS, especially is called afferent. And those are more unipolar neurons and they ascend right from my toe to my cerebral cortex where I cognate what I stepped on if it goes that far without a reflex. A reflex basically is a, is a muscle contraction that never reaches the CNS. I'm, never, I'm sorry, never reaches the brain. It only goes through the spinal cord. So you don't have to think about, you know, lifting my foot off the nail. I'm not gonna find out about it, you know, that I stepped on a nail, but the initial reflex when I step on a nail with my toe is of course, flexion of the knee to get my foot away from that pain or away from that, whatever is causing that tissue damage that ultimately transmits the pain to my cerebral cortex when I cognate. Motor neurons, like we said before, start, especially somatic motor neurons, they start in the cerebral cortex. Just somatic though, not the ones that go to the heart and glands. Those are autonomic. You don't use your cerebral cortex to change your heartbeat. I mean, I know you can meditate and do all that stuff. We'll talk about that later, but you, you really don't need your cerebral cortex. That happens autonomically, which is kind of automatically. But the point is that motor neurons come away from the CNS to the target organs, which I call effectors. So let's just review, because I'll ask you this on the test, probably. For the somatic nervous system, motor neurons, the only effector is skeletal muscle, and that's voluntary. For the autonomic nervous system, which is sympathetic and parasympathetic, the effectors or the target organs are your cardiac muscle, heart, your smooth muscle, which could be your blood vessels, walls or your digestive tubes, walls, reproductive, respiratory, and your glands. So somatic versus autonomic is something we should pick up on now. <clears throat> then you have these integrative or association and we call them interneurons, remember? Remember the sensory neuron was unipolar, motor neuron was multipolar. Now the interneurons are also multipolar and usually they don't have myelin. Usually they're unmyelinated and be become more part of the gray matter of the spinal cord or, or brain. So these are completely in the CNS. That's something you should take away from this. And they integrate functions. So it's, you know, I, I'll take a minute and I'll explain some of these functions before you go. But so we'll go through each of the neurons. Um, again, uh, I, we won't be doing this till after the exam two weeks from now. So we got a little bit of a break so I think that's where we'll end this particular, um, right here, right here, just so you know, the three types, you know, the, what the PNS, PNS is, what the CNS is, the difference between um, neuron and glial cells, all the parts of the neuron. Um, and that's basically it for the nervous system, just an introduction. So I, I'll try to give you some questions that um, are very tr short truncated so at least you can get an idea and, and you'll be ready for the next lecture. So any questions about any of that?